A lot of the work that uh, I've done in my career is exploring the interaction of facts and value judgments in social scientific research. And I've been doing this from two different angles. One is uh, to persuade social scientists that uh, actively engaging one's values in one's research uh, is totally fine and indeed positively desirable and generates more fruitful research. Uh, but part of it is also to persuade my fellow philosophers that it is high time that we actually study what the social sciences are doing and reflect on the bearing of the evidence that they gather on the value judgments that we philosophers are free to make, uh, but the social scientists often feel they're not free to make. So <clears throat> let's just start with a simple observation. Uh, and here I'm now addressing the social scientists uh, side of the question. Um, history and social sciences aim at answering questions about human conduct and institutions that bear very heavily on questions of human welfare, human flourishing, the quality of human relationships, the prospects for different groups of people under different institutions to be able to interact with each other cooperatively or peacefully and so forth. All of these are value-laden questions. Um, we ask, for instance, historians ask, did, uh, was the terror built into the founding ideological principles of the French Revolution? It's a clearly value-laden question, I think. Uh, important one to ask. Um, scholars, economists and scholars in the education field ask, can market competition improve school performance? Clearly a value-laden question, you need to actually define what kinds of performance would actually be valuable or helpful for children, then you can start inquiring. It's an empirical question as well. Psychologists and sociologists ask, is divorce bad for children? Clearly, value-laden question. All of these questions then are value-laden and they're answered with empirical methods. Um, I think a variety of dogmas about the distinction between facts and values have led researchers to suppose that methodolo methodologically sound social science has to be divorced from the making of value judgments in research. But I think these dogmas about the fact-value distinction are incoherent. Arguments that science is value-free suppose that values are science -free. That is the presupposition of the arguments for value-free social science is that values themselves, value judgments, are impervious to evidence and hence held dogmatically. Yet, when you read theorists of the value, advocating the value neutrality of the social sciences seriously, the main worry they express, here I'm thinking of Max Weber in particular, the main worry they express about value-laden social science is precisely that when the social scientist conducts research influenced by their social and political values, that it will steer them away from empirical evidence that might undermine their values. <laughs> that worry makes sense only if values are susceptible to rational revision in light of empirical evidence. <clears throat> For any particular evaluative position, there may be facts, as Max Weber properly insists, that are inconvenient for that position. And the duty of the objective social scientist is to uncover such facts. <clears throat> That's quite right. But then the key to sound social scientific research is to adopt methods that will ensure that we don't ignore evidence that's potentially relevant to assessing our evaluative views. The problem then is not value-laden inquiry, but dogmatic inquiry. Inquiry that is rigged in advance to protect our favorite social and political values from being undermined by inconvenient facts. So once we recognize 
that we need the social sciences most of all to answer our value-laden questions. We can see that value judgments pervade every stage of empirical inquiry, and properly so. We need to make such judgments to ensure that our study design is able to address the questions we're actually trying to investigate. So in the paper, of which here I'm just giving a short summary, <clears throat> I illustrate this point uh, by focusing on how value judgments properly uh, pervaded a study of the effects of divorce on uh, family members that was produced by our University of Michigan colleagues, Abby Stewart, Janet Malley, and their co-researchers. Uh, so this is a big question that we have. Is divorce bad for children? Is it bad for the parents? Um, <clears throat> Clearly a value-laden question of a tremendous interest if we think about uh, family policy, divorce law, and so forth. Um, so let's think a little bit, and here I, I go into much greater detail about how this piece of wonderful research uh, uh, is value-laden at various stages of the process of inquiry. Uh, but here I'll just give a very brief encapsulation of some of my findings. First of all, and most obviously, values that affect the way that we frame our research question. So traditionally, people who have asked questions about uh, the value of divorce ask, does divorce hurt children? Uh, Stewart and her colleagues asked instead, how do different families cope with divorce over time with what results? It's a very interesting alternative formulation because it leaves open the possibility of discovering some positive results of divorce rather than only looking for negative effects. But it leaves itself open to the possibility that in fact everybody's coping with it terribly. <laughs> right? It's an empirical question. It could really, maybe there are no positives. It leaves that open. So it's not dogmatic, uh, but it leaves this open. And also, uh, <clears throat> It leaves open the possibility that the significance of divorce for family members may change over time. So secondly, values affect the ways that we conceive of the object of inquiry. Traditionally, people have conceived the divorce as a kind of abrupt loss, an event, a single event in time that amounts to the breakup of a family unit. Stewart and her colleagues had a different conception of the object of inquiry, not as an abrupt break or a single momentous event, but rather as a process of coping with a failed marriage and of adjusting to a transformation of the family rather than of its breakup, where the key feature of the family, here they only study families with, uh, with school-aged children, where the transformation of the family consisted in the separation of spousal from parenting roles but where the parents continue to be functionally parents of the children. And this had a uh, major impact on the study design because it supported a longitudinal study design. You see a process unfolding over time rather than a cross-sectional study where, say, you would just study the children of divorce with the children uh, in uh, undivorced, where the parents are still married. Uh, and attempt to compare the welfare outcomes. Their objection to that was um, divorce already shows that the marriage was in trouble, so, and a marriage in trouble could also have a negative effect uh, whether the parents are uh, divorced or not. Thirdly, values affect what types of data to collect. So in particular, if you're interested on welfare impacts, you could just focus on objective data, for instance, on uh, the income of <clears throat> mothers post-divorce. We do know that it goes down, that is their, uh, the, the income uh, that's available uh, to produce consumables goes down after the divorce. But you can also ask what people's subjective reactions to those objective changes in condition are um, and introducing subjective evaluations uh, enabled Stewart and her colleagues to discover that although women had lower incomes post-divorce, they were more satisfied with their economic condition than before uh, because they had much greater autonomy over how to spend 
that income. So sometimes the value of some objective variable might change uh, because you have more control over it. Uh, fourthly, values affect data analysis. So here, in particular, Stuart and her colleagues were interested in whether uh, you should just look at main effects or uh, interaction effects uh, of the variables <laughs> being measured. And that has great relevance because if you focus on just main effects, then you can say, you know, in general, you know, divorce is good or bad in this dimension or that. But that might miss out on the ways different groups of individuals uh, uh, might be dealing with the divorce process. A function a focus on interaction effects, which is what they did decide to go for, enabled the discovery of the possibility that different groups of people are actually differently affected by the same phenomena. And in particular, they were interested in whether how well children did if uh, uh, the mother went to work after divorce. And that apparently had a different effect depending on how mature the children were, not just in age, but in actual psychological maturity, and also whether the mother had prior work experience or whether this was a new thing that she had to uh, uh, earn a wage. In my paper, I go through a lot of other decisions which were clearly affected by uh, value judgments. Um, <clears throat> but in all cases, I argue that the critical methodological issues involve structuring inquiry so that it's actually able to address the evaluative questions we have about social phenomena while ensuring that we're not being dogmatic that we're leaving ourselves open to evidence that might undermine our views about desirable social and political practices and institutional designs. And think of it, thinking of things that way enables us then to define different kinds of bias in inquiry uh, and to evaluate those kinds of bias. So in particular, I just want to throw out for you two different kinds of bias of interest. In my paper, I discuss three, but I just want to focus on two. So the first kind of bias is in relation to the hypothesis being tested. Okay, and here, what you want ideally is uh, for the study design to leave the hypothesis open to either confirmation or disconfirmation, and not just be biased towards selecting evidence that we tend in one direction or another, depending on the, our preferred answer. And it's possible to achieve that even if you do have a preferred answer, and even if value judgments have affected things, uh, uh, your conception of the object of inquiry and whether you're looking for main effects or interaction effects and all these other ways in which values can influence uh, inquiry. The second kind of bias that is important to avoid is what I call bias in relation to a question or controversy. <clears throat> so there are controversies over in society about uh, public policy. For instance, should public policy be designed to keep parents together or make divorce easier? <laughs> um, you know, should we have fault-based divorce require that one party be found to be fault in fault and so forth? And with respect to that question, um, legitimate social science may well be focused on searching for particular effects that may well be negative. For instance, you might want to study the question, and it would be a legitimate question, whether divorce increases the chance that the children will drop out of high school. Uh, but the more fruitful studies are those that are more likely to even-handedly uncover relevance, evidence that are relevant to all sides of the controversy. So this is a question of fruitfulness rather than validity. Uh, uh, Right, the more fruitful studies are the ones that are uh, more likely to even-handedly uncover evidence that's relevant to all sides in the controversy. So I conclude that arguments that science is value-free are actually supposing that values are science-free, that is, impervious to evidence and hence dogmatic. But is that supposition 
that values are science be free, is that supposed to be a fact or a value? <laughs> um, as a value, it's completely insane, <laughs> right? I mean, the idea that I should stick to my, to my value judgments come hell or high water, regardless of the consequences of acting on them, like that's just lunatic. <laughs> um, so it seems to me that the proper value judgment is that values are science laden, <laughs> right? Rational values are values that are attentive to the way the facts are. Uh, so factual and evaluative judgments then do not occupy separate hermetically sealed spheres for any rational person. And indeed, values are fully integrate, integrated into the web of belief. A valuative inquiry just is empirical inquiry devoted to answering evaluative questions. And value judgments in their turn guide inquiry towards the concepts, tools, procedures, and methods that inquiry needs to answer evaluated questions. Facts, evidence, tell us which answers are more likely to be true. Now these two roles have to be kept distinct so that inquiry doesn't end up being rigged simply to reinforce our evaluative preconceptions. But so long as they are distinct, to achieve uh, the active direction of scientific inquiry by value judgments is not only legitimate, but indispensable. 